I'm going to give a brief discussion, a brief revision of harmonic oscillators. Um, so let's just start with a simple harmonic oscillator um, where we know um, that the equation is that the mass times the acceleration, so psi double dot is an acceleration, which implies that psi is a distance, um, it's a displacement of some kind. And that's going to equal minus s psi. Um, so that tells us that the, the total force in the system is m psi double dot is given by um, the negative sign, so that means it's opposing, the, the force opposes the displacement. s is some constant, um, it might be a spring constant, and then psi is the displacement. Um, of course, if we were thinking about a pendulum, um, then psi would be the angle of the pendulum, um, and s would give us something related to gravity, because of course pendulums are pulled back down by gravity. If we had um, a spring on a frictionless tabletop, um, which of course doesn't exist, then we might have um, psi being the displacement away from the rest position. Um, if we had an atom in a solid, then psi would be the displacement away from its minimum. Um, you can think of a number of different situations, but in general, psi is the displacement, um, psi double dot is the acceleration, um, and s is the restoring force, and m is the mass. Now, to make things slightly simpler, um, we want to divide through by mass, um, so we're just going to do that. So we have psi double dot is equal to minus s over m psi. Okay, so we look at this and we see that we want um, a function whose second derivative returns the function but with a minus sign, so we might instinctively think of a trigonometrical function. Um, for generality, I'm going to suggest that we use psi of t is a e to the i um, omega t plus phi. Now the phi gives us the freedom to match different initial conditions. Um, so you could imagine if you want a playground swing um, where phi equals naught um, would imply that we start with the swing pulled all the way back. Phi is equal to, let's say, pi by 2 implies that the swing is at the base of its oscillation, etc., etc. You can, you can imagine a number of different ways of doing this. Um, I also want to point out that this can be written as capital D um, e to the i omega t, where d is a e to the i phi. So in this case, uh, d is fully complex, a is completely real, and the phase, that is the imaginary part, the complex part, is going to go into e to the i phi. If we take this and differentiate it, we have psi dot, um, that's going to be minus i omega, I'm sorry, no, that's going to be i omega, let's get the signs right here, that's i omega um, d e to the i omega t, um, and if we differentiate it twice to get the acceleration, that is minus omega squared, let's make that two a bit clearer, d e to the i omega t. If we substitute back into our original equation, um, then we get that minus omega squared d e to the i omega t is equal to minus s over m d e to the i omega t. Um, and for this equation to be satisfied, so this is true um, if omega squared is s over m, and normally we write omega naught is equal to the square root of s over m. Um, we choose omega naught because that is the frequency at which the oscillator will respond. That's its innate um, natural frequency. So that's a simple harmonic oscillator. Um, it's a system which, if you start it off with some initial displacement away from zero, will continue to oscillate forever because there is no means of losing or gaining energy. Um, let's consider now the damped harmonic oscillator, which is maybe a little more complex. Um, and generally in physics, things that are more complex are more interesting. Um, so again, we have m psi double dot um, is equal to minus s psi and now we're going to introduce a new term, minus b psi dot. Um, and this is the damping term. I'll just correct that m, which is a little bit funny. Um, so we now have a term which removes energy from the system. Um, when we substitute that in, uh, when we substitute in the solution for psi that we've had before, we find the following. We get um, minus omega squared d e to the i 
omega t, so the left hand side doesn't change. Um, I'm going to implicitly divide by m again is equal to minus um, s over m d e to the i omega t. That term doesn't change. And now we have an extra term. We have minus i omega b over m uh, d. There should be a capital D there. d e to the i omega t. Okay, so again we see that the terms d e to the i omega t um, are the same on both sides of the equation, so we don't need to worry about those. And so we find the following equation. We find that omega squared minus i omega b over m minus s over m is equal to zero um, to satisfy the equation, to satisfy the condition of the equation above. Now, this is a fairly simple quadratic. Um, it's true, so this implies uh, that omega is equal to i b over m plus or minus the square root of 4 s over m minus b squared over m squared. Um, we get the minus b squared over m squared because the i, when we square the i, we get a minus 1. Um, and that's all divided by 2. Um, so that's equal to i b over 2m plus or minus the square root of s over m minus b squared over 4m. Now at this point um, I'm going to introduce two new terms. I'm going to introduce gamma, which is just this b over 2m. Um, that's a measure of how strong the resistance term, the B term, is relative to the mass. Um, and we also introduce again omega zero is the square root of S over M. Um, and so we get omega is equal to I gamma plus or minus the square root of omega naught squared minus gamma squared. So this is the frequency at which our system responds. Um, you'll notice that this frequency is no longer the same um, as the frequency for the simple harmonic oscillator. By introducing the damping, we have changed the frequency at which the system responds. Whenever you see a term like a, a minus b or a squared minus b squared in an equation, you need to stop and think. Um, what will happen when a is bigger than b or when b is bigger than a? So in this case, we need to think about what happens for the different values, different sizes of omega zero and gamma. Um, and really, in terms of the physics, that's asking us, is the damping the most dominant effect, in which case gamma is going to be large, or is the natural response of the system, the omega zero, the dominant effect? Um, so let's think first of all about omega zero being bigger than gamma. Um, that means that we've got the natural resonant response of the system um, being dominant. In that case, the square root term is real, um, and we have an underdamped system. That's underdamped, um, and so you would find that psi of t would equal um, d e to the minus gamma t. Um, e to the i square root of omega naught squared minus gamma squared t. Um, so you have an, a term out front which gives you a damping term, that's e to the minus gamma t. Then you have an oscillatory term as usual. Um, let's just emphasize that that's the square root term. The second case is where gamma is bigger than omega naught. In this case, the square root is purely imaginary. Um, and we have the heavily damped. Um, the overdamped, maybe would be a better way of putting that. Let me just replace that with overdamped because that's the normal term um, system. Underdamped, overdamped. Um, so we have overdamped. Um, in this case, psi of t is d e to the minus gamma t, e to the minus or plus the square root of gamma squared minus omega naught squared t. 
Um, and if you want to think about that, what we've done is we've reversed the sign of the square root so that the square root itself becomes real. Uh, we, by reversing the sign, we have to take a factor of i outside, and that's why we have the two damping terms. Um, of course, the third term, the special case, is where gamma is equal to omega 0. Um, and in this case, omega is equal to gamma. Um, and this is the critically damped system. Um, and in this case, you would end up with a system which goes to zero as fast as is possible. Uh, one of the standard examples that's given for this that I've seen is a swinging door. Um, so you can imagine that a swinging door is not something that you want to be underdamped, um, because if there's a spring which is restoring it to its initial position, if it's underdamped, then the door is going to flap backwards and forwards and will, of course, present a safety hazard to those walking behind. Um, if it's overdamped, it's going to take a very long time for the door to close. Um, I'm sure you've all encountered doors like that. Um, and so you will try and achieve critical damping where the door returns to its initial position with the minimum of time. So we've covered simple harmonic oscillators, um, where there's simply a restoring force, and damped harmonic oscillators. Um, in the next video, um, Harmonic Oscillators 2, I will discuss the driven harmonic oscillator.